we're going to get started because Sarah and I were already talking about how we have a lot of content uh, to give to you all. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Adam Betchel. I'm the Director of Conservation here at Birds Georgia. And my colleague Sarah Tolv is going to be joining us uh, to go over some of the details for Project Safe Flight. Um, so I'm pretty sure you all are aware of what we're talking about tonight, uh, this program that we've had for about eight or nine years now. Um, so we're going to kind of give an overview of the issue with bird building collisions, how you can participate, how you can help at home, and what we are trying to do uh, here uh, at Birds Georgia related to this. But Sarah has done some awesome stuff. We have a couple polls we would love for you to fill out. Um, this first one, we just kind of want to know where everyone is. Uh, if we're all Atlanta folks, so we have a few people from the coast. Awesome. I'm glad to see some geographic diversity, not just the same old uh, folks uh, around here in Metro Atlanta. Um, as you know, probably, and as we're going to talk about, this program goes back to when we were the Atlanta Audubon Society. Um, and since then has evolved and, and now is a statewide program. And we're really trying to grow our efforts on the coast and elsewhere in the state. So regardless of, of where you are and what you answered in that poll, we're excited to have you tonight. Um, so let's dive into this. Um, I assume these first few slides are going to be preaching to the choir, but it's always good to go over some of these things. Who are we at Birds Georgia? Uh, maybe you're still not used to the new name. Um, our history goes back almost 100 years. Uh, we started as the Atlanta Bird Club in the 1920s. We joined the National Audubon Society Network in the 70s and became the Atlanta Audubon Society. 2020, we became Georgia Audubon as we expanded to try to partner with the other Audubon chapters across the state and fill in gaps where we thought they might exist. Um, and then as of late last year, we changed our name to become Birds Georgia. We are a member-supported, staffed nonprofit building places where birds and people thrive. And we try to do that work through community engagement, education, and then what Sarah and I do, conservation. So if you're new to the organization, welcome and thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, so why is it that Sarah and I have jobs with birds? Why are birds so cool? Why should you care about birds or why do you already care about birds? You know, birds inspire us. They are culturally important. They're religiously important. They're just spectacular. I was just talking slash bragging about some birding I was doing in Central Florida last week where I did see some stunning roseate spoonbills like this bird on the left. Birds provide just loads of eco services or different things that contribute to the ecological health of our habitats of our ecosystems, broadly speaking. And this includes dispersing seeds. So, you know, eat berries, fly elsewhere, deposit those seeds and hopefully lead to, to new plant growth. There are pest control. They're eating insects, you know, that might be on our crops, for example. They might be eating coffee borer beetles on coffee farms during the winter months. Um, there are cleaning crews, vultures, and they are important parts of the whole predator-prey interaction that keeps our uh, natural spaces functioning. They're also just beautiful. Uh, this is a photo I took years ago down on the Georgia coast of a painted bunting, one of the star birds of our state. And... Um, I always say it's hard to not be blown away uh, looking at a painted bunting, whether you're a birder or not. They are ever present. I just gave a talk a couple weeks ago with someone who was talking about beavers and coyotes, amazing creatures. But if you went out right now to find one of those, you probably would be hard pressed. But even in a crummy rainy day here in Atlanta, I don't know, I've probably seen five or 10 different species of birds and you know we can find birds all the time. Uh, they're around us and there's just loads of diversity. This is another photo from the Georgia coast. And maybe I should quiz Sarah since this is kind of in her realm, but there are seven species in this photo. Um, so there's just tons of birds, over 11,000 species um, and more all the time from you know new discoveries and genetic work. Um, but they're around us, they're diverse, they're important to our ecosystems and they are important to our economy. Um, the number I used to quote was 46 million bird watchers across the U.S., but the updated Fish and Wildlife Service numbers are somewhere like 60, 70, 80 million people who consider themselves bird watchers in our country, and they contribute billions of dollars to, to our economy, whether that's, you know, buying zip-off pants or bird seed or nice binoculars or going on trips. Um, so birds mean business as well. The problem is Sarah and I are working in conservation because birds are in trouble. 
Um, there was a big paper that came out in 2019 that showed that we had lost around 3 billion birds in the past 50 years. Um, and to give you an idea, because that number or the math here is a little bit funky, our breeding population in, in around 1970, we estimate as around 10 billion individual birds. And now if we look at that baseline of our breeding birds, we're at around 7 billion. So we're going to throw out some scary numbers that show that many more than 3 billion birds have died over the past 50 years. But the trend has gone down to now our breeding baseline is around 3 billion less. And we know this from the breeding bird survey, from academic research, and from long-term data sets like the Christmas bird count, which I know some of you contribute to. And with this scary, you know, big paper, um, we saw that the losses were not just rare birds or those that need pristine habitat. Um, they occurred across widespread common species, across a diversity of different families, from songbirds to shorebirds and everything in between. Um, and these losses match what we're seeing in insects, which of course are an important food source for many of our birds, as well as amphibians. So there are some troubling takeaways from this study. 60% um, of our wood thrushes have gone away in the course of one lifetime. Barn swallows are maybe one of the most common birds on the planet, or at least they were. Um, but in the U.S., we've had a 40% decrease in this period. And up in Canada, they're now even considered a threatened species. Um, so aerial insectivores, forest birds, grassland birds, all have been hit really hard. Um, the only, or some of the silver linings, I guess, of this paper were that raptors, so osprey, peregrine falcons, bald eagles, and then our waterfowl have all rebounded or increased during this time. That's where we've spent our money and put in our efforts, banning DDT, restoring and purchasing wetland habitat. So the good news is, and a lot of this talk is going to be not such great news, where we put in the money and the effort and the attention, it's not too late, I believe, um, to stem some of, these, some of these losses that we're seeing. Now, while that paper did not specifically call out we are losing birds because of these causes, we know what they are. And they did put forth these seven simple actions to help birds. And fortunately, these overlap really well with our programs here at Birds Georgia, our conservation programs. And specifically, this one at the top is what we're going to talk about today, making windows safer for birds. So we have our second poll of the day, I do believe. Um, thinking about what are these causes of bird loss, um, what or how would you rank um, these threats? These are the top three um, threats that our birds are facing right now. So which one claims the most bird loss each year, second, and then third? Which again, this is a bit of a sad, <laughs> morbid poll, but it's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like, I still see some votes coming in. You all are pretty close. Sarah, am I interpreting these polls correctly? Or how, do, how would you read it? Is it saying so? Habit is it the blue that would? Oh, I um, see. I see. Yeah, yeah. One should be the most. Yeah. Two should be the middle. And three should be the fewest. Got it. Oh, man. You all are too good. It looks like you nailed it. So you have habitat loss is number one. Looks like cats. Um, well, I guess cats you have is the second most, second top vote getter. Um, but technically falling behind collisions. There we go. Correct answer. All right, so you can see here, we have cats, habitat loss. Click on this box, there we go. Habitat loss, it's hard to quantify, but we know that's the top threat to birds. Um, that can be direct, meaning the clear cutting of forests or the draining of wetlands. Indirect could be um, non-native invasive plants weakening a habitat or taking away structural diversity or things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, outdoor and feral cats are a huge um, source of mortality for our birds. And then number three there is what we're going to be talking about today, which is collisions, specifically those that occur at windows or buildings. Um, and there are many other unfortunate ways that birds are struggling from vehicle collisions, electrical lines, fishing, bycatch, um, pesticide covered seeds, all sorts of scary stuff. <clears throat> and here's another graphic kind of showing how those compare to one another from a scale. So habitat loss, again, a major component. Climate change isn't really included in this, and we're going to see how that plays out. Um, and then cats, collisions, and then a bunch of smaller sources. So it's interesting, especially with wind turbines and other things being a bit politicized, um, we see how some of these other sources of mortality really uh, take a toll. So the number is 365 million to 1 billion birds annually in the U.S. alone 
are dying from running into structures, primarily buildings. Um, again, this is the third leading cause of bird loss. A new paper actually just came out last month that would double these numbers. Um, we're still kind of combing through to see how the data stacks up, but even on the extreme low end, we're looking at an average of a million birds a day running into buildings in our country. And while we can look at it from a, from a you know, per day basis, we really get two spikes um, of collisions throughout the year, and those tend to be spring and fall migration. So while birds hit year round, it's mainly a migration issue. And you can see we have billions of birds in our airspace, you know, 3.5 billion birds entering our southern border uh, right now and over the next you know month, month and a half. Many of those continuing on to Canada. And then in the fall, we have even more birds coming down with all the young of the year and things like that that are heading south. And as these birds migrate, many of them do so at night, which might be new to you. And they use, of course, geographical features. They use the earth magnetic field, but they also use the setting sun and the stars as a way to guide them. And as we have put more and more artificial light at night into the environment, this light pollution, it's becoming problematic for our birds. So as birds right now, they're crossing the Gulf of Mexico, they're hitting this storm front that we're having in Atlanta, for example, they're gonna come down and fly lower and they're gonna see all these bright lights. And we know from multiple, multiple published research papers out there that many of our birds are attracted to and confused by these bright lights where they might run into an illuminated facade or more frequently they land somewhere that they ideally wouldn't. And there they encountered the real killer, which is our glass. Transparent glass can be a problem. Um, the photo on the left is from New York City. So you can imagine if you're a little, you know, northern water thrush or oven bird, that's the most greener, greener you can find for blocks and blocks. So if you don't perceive that glass as a barrier, you're going to go to try to find food and cover in that greenery and it's not going to work out well for you. The photo on the right is from here in Atlanta. And with parallel glass like that, a bird might not even perceive a barrier and think they can fly right through. So transparency can be a problem. The bigger issue, however, is reflection. This is a beautiful, you know, little pocket patch of habitat um, at a high school uh, down in Kingsland on the coast here in Georgia. But right adjacent to it is this beautiful new building with that highly reflective glass. And so again, you're a prothonotary warbler or a perula, you're hanging out in that Spanish moss or you're feeding down from that puddle. You see a reflection of the exact same habitat. And for a bird who doesn't understand reflection, it looks like twice as much habitat. So you're going to fly to that puddle in the reflection, you're going to fly to that tree, and that's where the overwhelming majority of these collisions occur in these situations. So I know you all are bird people, and you're here to learn, and you care about birds, but, you know, Sarah and I and others at Birds Georgia have to talk to people about, oh, these bird brain things, how are they running in the glass? Um, but I always like to point out people aren't good at glass either. We technically can't see it. And there's plenty of photos like this and YouTube videos of people doing all sorts of silly things running into glass. Um, we don't see glass. We just know it's there. <laughs> we know it from our architectural knowledge. We know it from the framing of the doorways here. We understand where the glass is from the beams. I always like to point out in the photo on the right, you can even see a dotted line right about eye level, probably because they were concerned of people running into that glass. So we're not great with it. We just understand the cues. And if we remove the cues and I say, are you looking at a tree? Are you looking out of a window or are you looking at a heavily reflective surface? You can't tell from this photo. But then if we zoom out and give you something like this, you can say, okay, I'm looking at a reflection. But if you're a bird and you don't understand architecture, you don't understand framing, you don't know what's going on, it can look like more habitat. It can be very confusing. And in most of our cities, it can be quite maze-like and difficult for these birds to maneuver. So birds are migrating at night, billions of them throughout the season. They're attracted and confused by a nocturnal light. And then they're even more confused with our reflective or transparent surfaces. So we're gonna go a little bit deeper into these sources of mortality before we get into our project safe light. We're gonna start with light. Um, this is from the National Park Service showing the light pollution or the glow from Cumberland Island National uh, Seashore, which is a you know, relatively pristine dark place, but even there it's almost two times darker than what you would expect on a perfectly dark night. Um, at the Island Ford unit of the Chattahoochee National River, Rec River Recreational Area up here in Atlanta, it's 17 times brighter at night. 
Um, so pretty much anywhere except for the Okefenokee, you're looking at some, some light pollution. And as we said, lights at night attract and disorient birds. And to illustrate this, we're going to use kind of a cherry-picked example, but it really drives the point home. And that is the tribute in lights in New York City. These lights are turned on on September 11th when um, to commemorate those that were lost during the terrorist attack. Unfortunately for birds, this is when a lot of birds are migrating south over New York City. So we're going to show you a quick video here, and I'll turn my sound down. It came through a little loud last time. Let's see. Or maybe you'll need to turn your sound down, I guess. So what you're seeing here, if you can hear me speaking over this, <clears throat> it's going to come into focus. And you're going to see all these small little creatures floating around. We're looking up into the beam of light uh, at the Tribute Lights in New York City in 2017. But what you're seeing here are not moths or large insects. These are actually birds. Uh, you probably thought they were insects from the way that they're moving. They're not really moving like a lot of birds do. Some are just kind of drifting. Some are swirling. They're kind of going in every direction. Um, and the way this works in New York City is they have volunteers from Cornell and Audubon and other organizations who come and count the birds that they can detect in these beams of light. When they can count 1,000 birds, um, they will, oh no, <laughs> I was telling Sarah how I'm always worried I'm going to click on some, you know, unsavory YouTube video or something. Um, when they count 1,000 birds, they will cut off the lights and the birds will almost instantly disperse and hopefully continue on their way uh, without any issues. So this is from a study of these tribute and lights back in 2015. And so what you're looking at here on the left graphic, that is the airspace above the tribute and lights when the lights are off. They have not been turned on yet for the night. And there are only 500 birds in the airspace, a square half kilometer around the light source. 20 minutes later, after these lights have been turned on, there are 16,000 birds. So again, this is a cherry picked major example, but it illustrates how strong light is as an attractor to these birds when they're migrating. And as we know, birds don't store much fat and migration is extremely taxing. So any time and energy wasted flying around that beam of light is going to be potentially deadly for our migratory warblers and vireos and, and other species. But it's not just those super bright spots. We have light pollution growing all over the place. Right now, there are millions of birds probably flying over the Gulf of Mexico, and lots of them are going to encounter Houston as their first you know, landfall. Houston, the kind of illuminated developed area is now larger than the state of New Jersey. So again, this is going to draw birds into these major cities. Same for Dallas, same for us in Atlanta and across Georgia and throughout the southern parts of, of the U.S. This is a really tragic story from last year, and it seems like just about every year there's one of these massive collision events that I incorporate in my talk and have to share with everyone. This is from McCormick's Place in Chicago. It's a famous building, large conference center on the left there, and it's right on the water. And unfortunately, it's very glass heavy and it can be very bright at night. And the conditions were perfect for migration on October, I think it was 3rd last year. And just hundreds of thousands or millions of birds were streaming through the city, really amazing bird watching. But at this building alone in one night, over around a thousand birds perished because of the light pollution. And you can see some of the palm warblers and yellow rump, which are the most common species detected, as well as Connecticut warblers and Swainson's thrushes and bay-breasted warblers, all sorts of things. You can see the graph on the right. Um, but it shows you again, the light pollution is a major issue at these buildings when they're beams of light and just our growing urban sprawl. But again, the light is an attractant, but the main issue is the glass. And generally speaking, the more glass, the more likely a collision can occur at a building. <clears throat> I've actually had to answer a couple emails like this in the past week or so on, hey, do we see more collisions on the south side of buildings in spring and on the north side in the fall? Um, in general, no. Cardinal direction orientation doesn't matter. What matters is landscaping. What matters is other kind of difficult to determine things like the way other buildings kind of affect a space. But in general, the amount of glass on a, on a side, on a facade, the reflectiveness and what is being reflected are the better predictors on how problematic a building can be. And there are certain components of the building uh, that are more problematic than others. 
glass corners. This goes back to the transparency where a bird might think it can fly right through uh, these. These are actually perpendicular windows, but you can still see how the trees are visible from the far side. And you can tell that these people have put up black silhouette clings. So presumably they do have a collision issue here. Channeling, this is hard to, to see, but there's actually a glass door kind of down this walkway. And this is not something you're gonna likely encounter at your home, but there are ways that birds are unintentionally pushed towards a piece of glass, whether it's something drastic like this or even through the city, birds might be pushed unintentionally to a certain building where collisions can then occur. Again, this is another commercial issue more than a home, but green roofs are phenomenal. We need more of them. We just have to be careful about adjacent glass and how that can be an issue for the birds that are attracted to these spaces. <clears throat> Planted courtyards or enclosed atria can also be problematic. Birds come in for somewhere to rest and be safe, and then they're kind of trapped by the, uh, by the glass. And in general, on all these situations, on high-rise buildings, on your home windows, low windows typically are the worst. And that's because that's where the reflection is being, or that's where the reflection is showing vegetation. Um, I'm sure birds are hitting the 40th floor of a high rise that's just reflecting sky, but we know from lots of data that birds are going to come down to the trees, they're going to come down to the bushes, they're going to see reflections of those, and then that's when they hit the building. So the low windows are problematic. And it's not just our buildings, you know, sound walls or safety walls, bus stops, enclosed gazebos, anything or anywhere that we put glass out into the landscape like this can be an issue uh, for our migratory and resident birds. So big numbers, lots and lots of uh, birds colliding with buildings, high rise, low rise, residential buildings. Um, where do you think most of these collisions are occurring? Are they occurring at residential buildings? Are they occurring at low rise buildings? Or are they happening at these high rise, you know, massive buildings that we have in Houston, Chicago, New York, and, and even here in Atlanta. So it looks like we got a nice mix of people voting here. So what we see is that high rise buildings kill the most on average per building. So they do take the lives of a lot of birds. However, there aren't that many of them. You know, across Georgia, there's, I don't know how many high rises here in Atlanta and, and maybe a couple outside um, of the metro area. Um, there aren't that many throughout most of the state. So because there aren't that many high rise buildings, they actually make up a very small percentage. Homes account for over 40%. Uh, the average home probably only, you know, might be a problem for a few birds a year, but we just have millions and millions of them. But these low rise buildings, uh, many of them are still kind of in the suburbs, or outside of major cities, they still have good habitat around them. And our current aesthetic is to go with lots of mirrored glass. And so they can be extremely problematic for our birds. So even though high rise buildings are bad, um, there just aren't enough for them to make a serious contribution to the mortality estimates. So when we think about collisions, I've talked about a couple of these already, but more or less the more glass, the more likely a collision. If healthy, useful vegetation is being reflected, the chances of collisions increase. The amount of light is a solid predictor for attracting birds and then collisions. Migration is when most of these birds happen. And this is kind of an interesting study. The bird feeder thing I, I get a lot. Bird feeders that are reflected in windows can also be problematic. So the actual recommendation is to put them really close to your windows. The idea being the birds aren't going to get much momentum when they take off and they might be able to have a glancing blow and fly away. This study also unintentionally makes people think that 35 feet or further away is actually good um, for your feeder location. The problem is that study just didn't look out further than 35 feet. So um, bird feeding is great. We want you to be engaged with birds, but maybe treat your windows also or try to keep them close um, to the glass. So we keep talking about collisions and right now is a perfect time of year for some of you to experience something like this, a titmouse or a wild turkey or a summer tanager like this one attacking its reflection. These interactions almost never lead to more to death of the bird. They're mainly just an annoyance to the people on the inside of the glass and a waste of energy for the bird. The reason they're not deadly is you can see this bird is embracing for collision, for contact. And the reason is 
it's attacking its own reflection. It thinks another male or another bird is intruding on its on its territory. So as it moves closer, of course, the other bird moves closer and they're shadow boxing. They're about to make contact. So the bird tries to brace. Um, and that's why it's not too problematic for the bird uh, that's attacking itself. It's much more of an issue when a bird is further away. It sees a reflection of the tree that looks 5, 10, 50, 100 feet deep in the reflection. It's not expecting there to be a barrier. It's maybe a bit less of an uncluttered environment. There are hawks around, so they're really moving head first. The feet are tucked in when they hit these uh, surfaces. So that's the difference between the types of collisions we're talking about here that lead to mortality versus those of birds attacking their own reflection, which mainly occurs during the breeding season. So... We know a little bit here. We know lots of birds are migrating at night. Unfortunately, many of them are colliding. We know some of the predictors. Um, what can we do about it? How can we stop a barn swallow that's amazingly agile like this one from running into a glassy uh, side of a building? It first starts with understanding how these birds move, especially the migrants, because they're the ones that hit the most. So when we think about our Kentucky warblers that are getting ready to return to Georgia, Eastern Phoebes, which are going to probably be leaving the southern parts of the state soon. Um, most of these birds are small. Most of them or all of them are very good at maneuvering through tight spaces. They have a good sense of their body shape, size. They can move through tight areas. Think of like little sparrows going through bushes or warblers gleaning things off the underside of leaves. They know how big they are. They can move through tight spaces. And so we have to adjust to those life histories and those physical characteristics. And from a lot of research, um, a solution was determined that was called the two by four rule. Pretty much you need a visual cue to the bird every two inches vertically or four inches horizontally that alerts them, hey, this is not a clear flyway. Something's wrong here. It's not a tree as I thought. Something's wonky, go elsewhere. Um, and in the past few years, we've actually updated this and we now call it the two by two rule uh, because we're finding that is even more um, beneficial at reducing collisions. This especially is important for hummingbirds um, because they can fit through those four inch gaps if we use that spacing. So two by four or two by two is what we're looking for when trying to reduce collisions. We need a visual marker at that spacing. We know this from a couple different research stations, but one of the most important one is this one powder mill outside of Pittsburgh. They have a banding station, they're catching migratory birds. And for some of them, before they let them go on their way, they put them in this flight tunnel. And what the bird sees are the two panes of glass at the end of a dark tunnel. The birds are gonna fly towards the glass. One pane of glass is an untreated, either a completely transparent piece of glass. And then the other one has some sort of product or um, feature to the glass. It could be tapes, it could be things dangling, it can be patterns embedded in the glass. And then they can calculate how many of these flights do birds avoid the treated glass and go to the one where they can't detect a surface. There is a mist net there. These birds are not sacrificed. They're caught, they're safely let go, and they continue on their north or southbound journey. But this allows us to see what's effective uh, at reducing collisions. And this is where the two by two rule came from. In addition to the spacing, what we've learned is that visibility and especially contrast is really crucial. Birds have amazing vision, generally speaking, um, but they don't pick up contrast as well as we do. This is why a lot of the things we're gonna talk about today, especially any sort of things you wanna do to existing windows, need to be on the outside and provide again that pop. So you can see in the image on the left, there are black pieces of tape on the inside and on the outside of the glass. The inside ones you really can't see at all. The outside you can barely perceive. Uh, on the right, the white has more of that contrast and especially those on the exterior. So some of the things we're going to talk about with fixing problematic windows, we're looking at the exterior and lots of contrast, if at all possible. And because of this, that's why things like internal blinds or shades, while maybe better than nothing, are not that effective. You can see on the left image there, despite there being kind of a pattern, um, the glazing, the reflectiveness, ma mainly drowns out that signal. You can see the tree just as well as you can see the vertical striping. And on the images in the middle and the right, it's even stronger that the reflection is drowning out whatever, you know, blind or curtain might be drawn on the inside. Now those curtains will help at reducing light pollution, but they're not gonna handle the reflection. 
So that's a little bit of the backstory, why birds are colliding, how many, how we know it. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about our in-house program, and I'm actually going to hand it over to Sarah uh, to go over this in detail. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. That was yeah. great. Um, so, so we don't get too depressed and sad about all the birds colliding with windows. Um, we're going to take it to a happy, positive note and talk about Project Safe Flight. So some of the different things that um, different cities have been doing, what we can do here in Georgia, what you can do in your own home uh, to better, you know, bird proof uh, your windows. So going back all the way to 1993, not that long ago, um, FLAP, which is known as the Fatal Light Awareness Program, was started in Toronto. So almost like lights out, but a little bit of research going into um, why birds were colliding with windows and the lights issue. Um, a few years later in 1997, Project Safe Flight was born in New York City. Um, by Rebecca Kreshkoff, and after she found a deceased common yellow throat on her way into work one day, um, she created that Project Safe Flight that we now know here in Georgia. In 1999, Chicago Audubon, now known as Chicago Bird Alliance, created their Lights Out program, which is now um, one of the most kind of participated in projects that uh, um, of the Lights Out programs. Chicago has really high participation in their downtown area. Um, unfortunately, they still, as we learned, still do have issues with collisions. Um, but in 2015, Adam uh, created what we now know as Project Safe Flight Georgia in Metro Atlanta. Uh, and that was now to date about 4,200 birds of 135 species. So a uh, lot of data going into that over the last nine, almost 10 years now. And then in 2023, we soft launched Project Safe Flight down to the coast and brought um routes down to Brunswick and Savannah, and hopefully this year, picking those up a little bit more. So since formal monitoring began in 2015, more than 4,200 birds of over 135 species have been documented as a part of Project Safe Flight. So every green dot, every red dot um, denotes a bird. Um, so we do use smapping software so we can kind of tell where these collisions are happening, and hopefully that's informing our data um, and some of our policy, hopefully, initiatives a little bit later on. So Atlanta was ranked ninth most dangerous city in the spring migration and fourth most dangerous in fall migration, according to Cornell. Um, and we'll kind of see that why that is, but it's the flyways, how the birds are kind of flying through the United States. Um, in the, the spring, they're kind of going more westerly. Um, and in the fourth, they're coming down that Atlantic coast. Um, so a little bit. And here is the list of the top 10 most dangerous cities. So again, you see in the spring, Chicago is going to top the list both in spring and fall. Houston and Dallas also rounding out the top three. Uh, but then you see in Atlanta, at number nine. And in the fall, um, some of those more Atlantic cities are taking the top 10. So we have New York and Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia all on the East Coast. So what Project Safe Flight aims to do, we aim to have volunteers patrolling some of our routes in search of these birds that have collided with buildings. Um, spring collision monitoring did start last month, officially March 15th, and continues until May 31st. Um, as we mentioned, Atlanta, ninth on the list in the spring, but collisions are still happening, even though they are more numerous in the fall. So definitely fall, um, we're going to be on the ground hopefully running on the in the coast, but in the spring, kind of just getting our bearings here. So August 15th through November 15th for the fall window. But as you're walking, you're collecting data using the ArcGIS field maps and then reporting any incidental birds. If you do find a bird that's still alive but injured, um, we do have some different rehabilitators that you can bring them to. We have one in Pooler outside Savannah. Um, they do ask that you call first. You can Take a picture of this slide if you need it, um, but it will be available after the presentation. Uh, and then in the Atlanta area, um, Chattahoochee Nature Center, Aware Wildlife Center, Ackworth Wildlife Center, and Wild Nest Bird Rehab all take um, collision victims, rehabilitate them, and then release them back to the wild. So um, I'll, I'll chime in real quick. Uh, yeah. They're all great. We work with all of them. Wild, wild Nest has been the recipient of most of our birds the past couple of years. Um, Aware was our original partner. They still are a great partner, but they, all these people are extremely busy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if you're an Atlanta volunteer and if you have questions about this, I'm happy to, to address those, but, um, 
all great partners with Wild Nest taking a lot of our birds recently. Awesome. And then I know we do have Dr. D Don Drumtra in the, in the presentation. So um, some of our collected birds do go to different universities. If they're in good condition, they're going to University of North Georgia um, for some disease studies. Georgia Tech, Kennesaw State, Oglethorpe University, and the University of Tennessee for a um, food study, a stomach content study. But the data is a tool for understanding the geography and the dynamics of the urban bird collision issue and it improving our understanding of the causes of these collisions. So um, seeing what condition they were in when they collided with the window, typically you're not getting these great specimens. So it's a great opportunity and nothing's going to waste. Um, so it's a great, great way to use these. And then what is our data actually telling us? So for the nine years that we've been collecting, it's mostly passerines. So the songbirds, perching birds, which your warblers, your vireos, all those um, that Adam mentioned, and that accounts for a good chunk. Um, I left unidentified birds out of this just so that it wasn't unidentified in the big circle, <laughs> uh, but songbirds and then hummingbirds, number two, ruby throated hummingbirds are the only type of hummingbird that we've collected. Woodpeckers next on the list with 188 specimens, and then going down all the way to kingfishers and greaves, which again, you're not really thinking those are collision victims, but uh, that kind of rounds out our top most common. And another fun chart, uh, most common family. So again, mostly warblers, but also thrushes, um, hummingbirds, woodpeckers, waxwings. Waxwings tend to collide in groups um, so we get a lot of those all at one time, mockingbirds, buntings, cardinals, finches, um, and some of the less common ones all the way down. And here is our top 10. So ruby-throated hummingbird is the top collected species. So with 424 specimens, approximately. Tennessee warbler coming up second, swings and thrush, cedar waxwing, ovenbird, yellow-bellied sapsucker, wood thrush, American robin, common yellowthroat, and red-eyed vireo at number 10. Uh, and again, it's not counting unknown specimens. Another thing to, that I always point out is um, ruby throated hummingbirds are kind of interesting because they are a daytime migrant. So I talk so much about light pollution, which is definitely an important thing. But at least in Atlanta, um, we get a lot of hummingbirds. And there's been some studies done at Duke and other places where they also detected a lot of hummingbirds. So I, I think we're just right at, we have the right geography and latitude and maybe the right landscaping to really attract them. And um, who knows how many we're missing? You know, they're teeny. I'm always amazed that we find so many. So it's, um, it would be sad no matter what the top bird was, but I think it really hits people when they see that it's uh, our hummingbird. Yeah. And um, also as a side note, all the, the data that was shown all comes from Metro Atlanta. Our efforts in coastal Georgia had very small sample size, so I did not include them into the, the graphics, but it's mostly common yellow throats. Um, and then cedar wax wings were number two. So as far as the coast goes, those are our top two. Um, but how can you volunteer? You can, uh, we're gonna put the routes out and then you can choose your favorite route, maybe one near your home, maybe one near your workplace, one, um, some universities, if you're going to, you know, go into class, you wanna walk your route on your way to class, that's a great way to do it. Um, anything that's accessible to you and that will be completed often is the best way. So. Don't need to go very far out of your way. We just want um, the routes done as often as possible. You're going to collect your data. You're going to complete it, um, get all the information that's required, and then submit it in a timely manner so that that does get um, put into our database. It's not getting double counted, anything like that. Collect specimens. So if it is in good condition, um, you can label it and then drop it off at our freezer at the office. Or if you're down here on the coast, um, at one of our two receiving locations, the one in Savannah or the one in Brunswick, and then submit the data either to field maps through the app, which we'll talk about, or through DBIRD if it's uh, incidental, which we'll talk about. But please, please always take a picture, um, write as much details as you can. Um, it just makes it easier um, when we're looking back at it. And side note, if you're on a university campus or somewhere well-traveled, move the bird either uh, dispose of it if you're not collecting it, but move it uh, so that it doesn't get reported again if that is a traveled route, uh, unless you can't if it's on a ledge or something. Uh, but while you're on the route, you're going to walk slowly. You're going to scan about your arm's width 
from the building. So two to six feet from the building, you're checking the shrubs, the awnings, the ledges, and the glass, just because uh, sometimes they hit the window and fall into the bushes. Um, might be a little difficult to find them sometimes, and you're definitely going to miss some, but that's okay. Uh, if you find one, you'll fill out, fill out a field card and take a photo, hopefully with the bird and the field card in the same picture. You'll drop a pin on the field maps, and you can adjust it to make sure it's on the right side of the building. Label a specimen, put the card in the bag, and the plastic bag inside the brown bag, um, specifically down here on the coast. It's one of our please, please do items. Uh, and then you can drop off the specimen at the receiving location and update the volunteer effort log, which is on the Google Drive. And we'll share that. This one, you all can take a picture of if you do not use the ArcGIS field maps app yet, uh, especially if you're on the coast, you can just take a picture of the username and the password and you can log in. Everybody uses the same account um, and then add your birds to that. Once you get on the route, I won't be reading all things. <laughs> and then once you're on the ArcGIS field map, so it does require either downloading the app on your smartphone or logging into the web browser. And um, you can add the map, the bird collision monitoring map, but the basic information that's required is the date, the time, location, if you're on a route or not, the status of the bird, if it was dead or alive, or if you sent it to rehab, and if the species, if you know it, if you don't, please take a picture, and then we can identify it later. Sometimes um, it might be difficult if they're not intact or fresh. But the more information is the better. <laughs> I'll chime in again, just one more thing with um, field maps. The good thing is before we talk about D-Bird, you can do multiple photos here. So I always encourage if you have the time to maybe do, do it as the bird is lying and then maybe get one from the other side, roll it over, things like that. Um, and this might seem like a lot of info, but it, it's, it's quite easy. The date and time and location are going to auto populate when you turn on the app. So that's all there. So it really is like three or four questions and a couple photos. So we, we are trying to make it as easy as possible for you all. Yeah, and then here's what field maps looks like. If you open it up, you will see a lot of dots around Atlanta um, and a couple little dots on the coast. So um, this is why we know that we don't have a lot of volunteers down here on the coast because our little green dots need some work. So if you, do zoom in on field maps, it'll show you the route, it'll show you where to start, show you kind of the path that we um, suggest you walk. But again, you can kind of do that whichever direction you feel, um, one, one way down the road and then back the same way so you um, see it from a different angle. But two routes in Brunswick, one on the downtown kind of streets and then one on the College of Coastal Georgia campus. Um, we also have the DNR buildings on the right hand side. Uh, and then the routes in Savannah, we have three of them. Uh, but this is what the maps will look like. The green dots are birds. So once you do find a bird, um, please record all information that you are able to. If you can't identify it, select unknown, add a picture, uh, and that would be very helpful to us. And um, if it's in good condition, please use the supplies and drop it off at a freezer um, as soon as you are able or take it home, put it in the freezer until you're able to get to one of those locations. Um, and then once you are uh, able to bring it to one of those freezers, I think the next slide. Uh, oops. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> so for your route, um, just make sure you're doing it whenever you're able. That's done in the morning. Uh, after, you know, they were attracted to the artificial light, they came down into the city. Um, they're going to rest a little bit. And the next morning, they're going to wake up to go feeding. Uh, so that's typically when, when, those birds are going to be colliding with the window. So best in the early morning before scavengers, before cleanup crews um, do come and get the birds and um, we can find them. And I did see a Q&A. So awesome. Thank you, Mary. Um, Mary Kimberly. So more than six feet, 10, up to 10, up to 15 feet away from buildings. Uh, really just kind of, so you are aware that the bird did collide with the building. So we don't ac accidentally attribute those to something else, but anywhere from zero to 15 feet, that's definitely um, a distance that might be contributed to the building. So good comment, Mary Kimberly. And then incidental reporting, we are using D-Bird for that. And here's our brown bag on the side. But uh, 
you might have heard of eBirds. So we have a lot of we have a lot of birders in this group, I'm sure. So you're using eBird religiously. You're um, recording all your sightings, these lovely birds that you're seeing every day. But we also have D-Bird um, for dead birds. <laughs> um, and D-Bird is an online crowdsourced data collection tool um, launched by the New York City Audubon. Uh, but also we helped pilot some of this. So uh, it's a good way to report any dead or injured bird that you find. So whether that was a vehicle collision, a uh, cat, any any sort of death, um, you can report that on D-Bird. And specifically, if you're not walking a route, this is what how we're asking you to report it. So um, D-Bird is going to ask the species. If you don't know, that's okay. Male, female, age. Again, that's okay if you don't necessarily know that. The date, the, the status, and then the cause of death. And again, if you don't know the answers, that's great. Just put unknown. And then we have access to the backside of D-Bird so that we can pull those out for the state of Georgia. But for our community engagement, in addition to Project Safe Light, we encourage individuals and commercial entities to participate in Lights Out Georgia. So it's not just right the glass, but also the light. So the two-pronged approach, um, we're using technology developed by Dr. Kyle Horton at Colorado State University to provide real-time alerts during peak migration, which um, you're going to get a handful of these throughout the season, but you can sign up using the QR code there, scan it, and you'll sign up for the lights out alerts, which again, on peak migration nights, you'll get an alert and all you do is turn off your lights. So it's really great um, way to something easy, save yourself some energy costs um, and just turn off those lights, save some birds. So Lights Out has some benefits besides decreasing bird building collisions, energy and cost savings. You can enjoy the stars. So again, um, as Adam mentioned, the only dark sky official site in Georgia is the Okefenokee Swamp. So if we want to try to compete um, with the swamp, we're going to have to turn off our lights and enjoy the stars from our home. Um, but it doesn't just help birds. It also helps bats um, and also sea turtles. So if you live here along the coast, there are some local ordinances, but... Uh, you can help turtles too, and you can help yourself um, because it doesn't increase health benefits like lower stress, improved sleep, regulation of hormones, and especially melatonin, which is the most important sleep hormone, and then circadian rhythm. So turn off those lights. It's better for birds. And it's better for you. And some recommendations from the International Dark Sky um, Organization. And so this is just kind of basic lighting principles for outdoor lighting. So is it useful? If it's not useful, go ahead and turn that off. Is it targeted? Um, down shielded lights are better. Um, so it's actually, ooh, yeah, good question. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, target, targeted lights, um, low level lights. So warmer lights are better. Um, and if they're on a lower, so you can dim them instead of leaving them all the way as bright as they should be controlled. So on a timer, if you can, maybe motion activated floodlights um, and then warm colors. So things closer to the orange or the red are better than something that's bright white. And I'm sure we can relate to this with all the bright LED like lights on the road, um, pretty blinding sometimes, but those warm colored lights are more agreeable to our vision and to birds vision. Um, question in the chat, how does Project Safe Flight use the data collected by volunteers? Does it sometimes lead to remediation of problematic buildings? And we'll get to that a little bit um, later, I think so. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Um, so here's a good image again by the International Dark Sky um, Organization. So it shows five different lights ranging from unacceptable to the best. Um, so if you do have the option to change out some of your lights or maybe make a difference in your homeowners association or your business or, um, you know, public spaces that you have an invested interest in. Um, the best are fully shielded down, um, pointing down, and maybe on a timer as well. Yeah. And we've got a very beautiful picture of Atlanta and the skyline here. So um, some of you may be able to recognize some of these iconic Atlanta buildings just by the shape of shape of them. I do not. <laughs> uh, and then this skyline where the lights have been dim um, and the, you can still tell which buildings they are, but 
Uh, just which skyline do you prefer? It's nice and dark and better for birds. Yeah, so how can you guys help in your own homes and elsewhere? So in residential areas and low rises, um, reducing vegetation near glass, again, since that is one of the main causes that we're seeing, so the actual vegetation reflecting. Um, install netting, so those insect screens on your glass, as long as it's about an inch off the glass, um, does stop com collisions almost completely. You can install decals on problem windows, not the one big decal in the middle, but two inches by two inches. Transition to bird-friendly glass. I know that's not an option for most homes, but uh, once it gets a little bit more affordable, maybe next time you're transitioning your windows out, you can look at those bird-friendly options. And then the DIY do-it-yourself solutions are very affordable. Uh, the a copy and bird savers are pretty much just pieces of string uh, tied at the top, hanging down. Um, very easy, very inexpensive. Tempera paint, it's washable. You can go ahead and change it for every season. You can have um, your friends, family, grandchildren, anybody paint on your screen or on your glass. And then the insect screens again. And then for low rises and high rises, you can turn off your lights, close the blinds at night, incorporate bird-friendly design elements into new and existing buildings, and then adapt green building certification standards, um, like the LEED certification that is now um, incorporating some bird-friendly building practices. All right. And back to Adam. Yeah, that was great, Sarah. Thank you so much. So um, I think she did a, a great job. We need people to get out and, and help us get this data. Um, the reason some Atlanta Audubon volunteers and myself kind of worked on this years ago was, A, we were finding these birds and didn't know the scale, where, what species, what could be done about it. And also we'd heard from other cities that if we didn't have that local data source, it was going to be hard to get to the next steps, which is what that question so perfectly teed up for us. So Atlanta, you know, we had a question from Mary Kimberly. She's been with us since day one, her and her husband Gavin out there pounding the pavement. Um, <clears throat> it's not an easy gig for you all volunteers. And I'm sure some of you are, are going to stick with it. And some aren't. It's, it's challenging. We love birds. This is a video of a summer tanager I took a couple months ago in Costa Rica. It's amazing. That bird might be back now in South Georgia, starting to get ready to get on territory. Um, but in addition to outlining how to participate from a project safe flight, picking a route, walking that route, looking for dead and injured birds, we can send all these resources to you after the fact. We have written up help documents and Sarah and I are here to work with you. So this was just kind of a quick overview. But I also wanted to show before we left, what are we doing with this data? Because we do have eight plus years now of, of some data. Um, what you're seeing on the right there is our first ever window retrofit. This was at the Chattahoochee Nature Center on the north side of Atlanta. And what we were doing is putting up stickers on the outside that have high contrast at the correct spacing to make the birds aware that the reflection they're looking at is not a clear flyway and a safe place to go. Um, come on, there we go. Another one that we did uh, last year, this is at Camp Jekyll. This was our largest installation to date. Uh, with a feather friendly product. They also have this product for residential properties. So if you have a problematic window or two at home that you can access the exterior, um, this is a great product. Um, but we at Birds Georgia have now done, I think around 15 of these retrofits, uh, a couple on the coast, many in Metro Atlanta, and we're working on a few more coastal properties. So again, this is something that can be done to break up that reflection at the correct two by two spacing to make sure birds do not glide. So this is one of the things we're doing that we're using that collision data. Um, one thing that I've answered a bunch, and I think we're going about it the right way, but honestly, it's, it's I'm sure it's not perfect. Um, a lot of our collision data is from downtown Atlanta or Buckhead or Dunwoody. Um, and I personally is the one who's normally been tasked with the responsibility of this program and making these decisions have struggled with do we retrofit the backside of a commercial property that is the most deadly that we monitor, which in theory should have lots and lots of money from that property, the tenants? Or do we go somewhere that has, has an issue, but maybe a little bit less of an issue and the education value is high? So here at Camp Jekyll, we're talking about thousands and thousands of students and other visitors coming to see these dots. So not only is it going to save the 20, 50, 100 birds that might have collided at this building, but it's going to educate lots of people. And I think on Jekyll, it's a great example because the Jekyll Island Authority 
has since this, you know, we paid for this installation from a grant that we received. The Jekyll Island Authority has now paid for their own installation at other buildings. So um, a lot of the buildings that we monitor that Mary and Gavin and other volunteers of ours look at, um, we've actually used that data elsewhere, if that makes sense. And um, I'm always torn if that's the right thing. Um, and, and we're looking for larger solutions to maybe addressing some of those big commercial properties. In addition to retrofitting those problematic buildings, and again, we're doing as many as we can afford uh, when we get grant funding, we've been working with architects and other developers on new construction. Um, this is a graphic from the Candida, Innova or the Candida Building of Innovative Sustainable Design on Georgia Tech's campus. And to my knowledge, it was the first building in Georgia that was constructed with bird safe glass from the beginning. There are some other buildings that might be bird safe on accident, uh, or have glass that maybe is less dangerous, but this actually has tested approved glass that shows to reduce collisions by over 90% with this ceramic dot pattern. Uh, it's a frit that's embedded in the two panes of the glass. So we're working hard on trying to get more buildings constructed like this. Our, our new office has this glass um, and there are a few more that are, are hopefully slated to be coming on soon. So we're getting people to collect that data. We're using that data to get grants, to then retrofit buildings. We're using that data and our knowledge to advocate uh, for smarter new construction, education and advocacy. But it's also good to see what we can glean from this larger data. So what we're looking at here, I'm gonna to try to go through this really quickly. The green and yellow and red that you see is the normal precipitation that you look at when you see a weather forecast. The white dots are all the next rad radar stations across the country. I think there's 130 some. Um, but the blue circles you're looking at are birds uh, moving. So we can actually pick up birds using our radar systems. So those pulses are birds at night taking off and migrating past those radar stations. Um, and so with this technology, we can now quantify and predict uh, when and where birds are moving over and what densities. We can look at historic wind and weather patterns, dates to know with some rough idea how many and when these birds are going to fly over. And so we've been using this data now with our partners to achieve a couple different goals. One is the lights out alert. So Sarah mentioned we have our lights out program. We want you and you at home and you at work and anyone we can get on board to reduce lighting during the entire spring and fall season, those 90 days or so in the spring and the 100 and some days in the fall. Um, but for some people, that might not be very palatable. So what we know from this amazing migration data and from being able to quantify this is that over 50% of all our migratory birds are going to move over a space in 10 to 12 nights per season. So if you won't, or the manager of a big building won't turn off their lights for the entirety of spring, maybe we can find a way to communicate to them, hey, these are the 12 big nights can you at least do it then to have the highest impact? And so uh, working with professors at Colorado State and Cornell, we've worked and they've now launched this nationwide um, on doing these lights out alerts. So this night, if it's a night that's a red night, which this night was a couple of years ago uh, for most of the state, that means for that geography, it's one of those top 10 or 12 nights it's super important to reduce your lighting on these nights. So again, we want lights out the entirety of the season, um, but if you won't do that, can you get the most impactful nights? And so this is something that we're trying to continue to spread the word about and increase the audience who's receiving these notifications. <clears throat> and this dovetails nicely with BirdCast, uh, which has historically been approached more from a birding standpoint, but it's also useful for conservation where you can go and say, hey, Camden County, Last night, there were over a million birds and uh, in the air at one time. Here's how many crossed. Here's how many were in DeKalb County. You can look at really exciting things and actually quantify the birds overhead, which is still like the coolest thing, in my opinion. And they've even gotten more fine-tuned where they can say, these are the likely migrants that are flying over. Of course, we don't know from their little dots in the sky, but from timing and from what's being detected, we can make assumptions on, hey, this is a great time for palm warblers and savannah sparrows. And it's just the beginning for prothonotary warblers. <clears throat> so that was some of what was really groundbreaking <laughs> just a couple of years ago. 
still very informative and very amazing. But what they've been able to do now is do a finer sweep of that info. So I'm going to hop back a couple of slides. This, the where you see the red, that means there's a higher concentration of birds. Um, but what these maps are showing you is a snapshot of what's in the sky three hours post sunset. It doesn't tell you where they land. It doesn't tell you how far they fly. It's still incredibly informative and was a major step, but it was a bit crude. This is still a bit crude, but it's getting much more finer in scale. What you're seeing here is people at Colorado State, partners of ours, have looked at 20 years of migration data using the weather radar systems and looked at where birds are actually stopping and uh, taking off from during migration. Now, there is some modeling here. You know, not all these birds had geo trackers or things like that. So we're looking at historic data, what the weather radar systems tell us, where we know birds are stopping. And then we're looking at predictors like habitat uh, intactness or healthy marshes or even light as a predictor. And the darker the teal, the higher the stopover intensity, meaning more birds are stopping there. So on the left, you're looking at springtime. So you can see the coast, the Okefenokee, the North Georgia mountains. But you can also see even around Atlanta, there's a good bit of teal. Then look at the fall, the coast, the Okefenokee, parts of the North Georgia mountains are still very high intensity stopover spots, but a lot more in the middle of the state. And the top predictor on over 70% of the models done by Colorado State for, for our state and across the country was light pollution. So it wasn't intact green space or it wasn't proximity to a river that were the best predictors of where birds are stopping. It's light pollution, which really drives home what Sarah and I have been talking about for the past hour. So this is some of the other next steps and evolutions of the Project Safe Flight data that's being collected. What else can we do? How can this inform other conservation ac actions? How can we take this info to partners of ours to maybe not only reduce collisions, but maybe purchase land or prioritize green spaces that are being used for migration? Sarah touched on this briefly earlier, and she mentioned our, our friend Don is here, who's a, a great partner of ours. What are we doing with these birds that we're asking you to pick up? Not everyone wants to pick up a dead bird, and we can work with you on that. Um, but for the past few years, the overwhelming majority of them have gone to the University of North Georgia, and they've been used for museum specimens, for teaching labs, for infectious disease work, for new innovations in preserving specimens, all sorts of different uh, uses that we're trying to make the most of these birds that unfortunately their lives were cut a bit short. Um, and then in just the past year or two, we've started these new collaborations where we're sending stomach contents of thrushes to the University of Tennessee, where they're going to look at how those birds may be carrying out long distance seed dispersal, you know, swallowing seeds up in North Carolina, flying a few hundred miles, hitting a building in downtown Atlanta. Um, what seeds are in their gut and how might that explain the distribution of certain plants? And then the bird genoscape project out in Colorado, we're sending them tail feathers so they can do DNA samples to try to delineate distinct genetic populations within a species and then look at the conservation threats of those birds. So Hypothetically, we see a lot of Tennessee warblers. Maybe they're all coming from, you know, northern Quebec, and there's a conservation threat for those. And our tail feather and DNA data will help um, answer some of those questions or come up with priorities of what we need to focus on moving forward from a hemispheric uh, standpoint. <clears throat> and then the last frontier, I know Mary and some of the others who have been on many of these talks have heard me say this. We really need to go after legislation or building ordinances. I've put, we at Birds Georgia put a lot of effort into getting two buildings built with bird safe glass. It's not sustainable. Um, so more and more cities, New York being the most aggressive, have passed bird friendly ordinances and just in the past few years. And that's something we're just starting to talk to uh, mainly around the Atlanta area. But Sarah and I have also been talking with people down in uh, McIntosh County about lighting and, and other things where we can have a much larger impact on reducing these collisions and not just putting stickers up or going building by building, trying to construct smarter structures. So finally, Sarah already mentioned the ways you can help. We need more volunteers specifically on the coast, but we definitely need them in Atlanta too. We have a small but passionate cohort of folks. Um, so in addition to volunteering and supporting Birds Georgia, think about what you can do at home to make your windows safer. Um, there are professional products and tapes and things you can dangle, but shutters, old school insect screens, 
Um, I have a six-year-old. We haven't detected a collision here, but if we do, maybe I'll just let her paint on the windows that we can clean off after migration. All these things can reduce collisions at least somewhat, and you can do your part to help birds. So again, please consider monitoring. Hopefully this was informative. Sarah and I have all sorts of resources and we're here to guide you through the process to get you comfortable. We can pair you with an existing volunteer who might be able to show you the ropes if we can't help you. Um, if this looks like or sounds like too much, or if you just don't have the flexibility in your schedule to, to go out and do a route, please report whatever you might come across, whether it's at you know the Winn-Dixie or Publix or on your way to church. If you see a bird, please let us know. Again, make your home safer for birds. Keep your cats indoors and put stickers on your windows. Now you know about the problem. So you're part of our, our tribe here. Please go spread the word. You're part of the flock. Um, and what's really exciting, but also devastating at times, is we know how to fix this now. The products are here. The prices are coming down. We really know what's going on. It's so, you know, we need to address habitat loss. We need to address climate change. But this is an almost completely solvable problem. Now that we have this technology and we have these products, we just got to get the word out there and convince these people that their buildings won't be ugly and they can still have lights. They still, still can have glass. We just need to be smarter about how we go about using it. So thank you so much for that, uh, for your attention, for your time. Um, and we would love to answer any questions. Um, I know Sarah's been monitoring the chat, but feel free to throw those in. Um, there are emails, we're easy to find, and we are definitely eager to talk about this issue. So um, any questions about the program, about collisions, about migration, uh, we're happy to help with those. So again, thank you so mm -hmm. much. And, and we will follow up with, uh, this should be recorded, and we have other resources, again, if you're interested in volunteering, that can kind of get you started on that path. Adam, we did have a question from awesome. Ms. Jennifer. Um, so before concluding, can you speak to any efforts nationally, statewide, or locally to involve architectural and landscaping organizations? Yes. So I can talk about a few of those. So locally, I have presented to the American Institute of Architects multiple times, um, mainly here in Atlanta. I have also served on a national panel for that. Um, and I've even kind of been pulled out of nowhere to talk to a group in Michigan and Chicago. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking about it as much as I can. Um, so the architectural um, community, we have been involved somewhat. The big thing we need to figure out here in Georgia, and it's, it's on myself and Sarah, is to reach out to our Building Owners and Managers Association, to our BOMA. I tried years ago um, because other states and cities have had success with that. We did not get much traction at the time, but I think it's time again. So locally, we are talking and have relationships with certain building management companies, architectural firms, and the National AIA chapter for sure. Um, I am on a monthly call with other practitioners or other Audubon, you know, nonprofit organizations like Birds Georgia who are working on this issue. So we're sharing ideas, we're sharing data, um, and that includes people from New York, Chicago, Texas. San Diego, Portland, all over the place, uh, the Valley out in California. So there is a cohort of us working on it. Um, National Audubon, it's been very up and down, uh, to, to be quite honest. I don't think it's always been their highest priority, but they do a good job pulling together uh, people like us uh, to try to work on these efforts. And it is part of their strategic plan or their flight path. Who I think is doing the most exciting stuff is the American Bird Conservancy. They have a rating system for products. They're working with developers. So there is a, there's definitely a local effort. And Sarah and I are mainly the driving forces behind that with the power of the volunteers who have been supporting us. Um, nationally, there are various networks. It still needs a bit of cohesion, to be honest with you, because the Audubon folks have been doing their thing and ABC has been doing their thing. And while there is some communication, I don't feel like there's full buy-in from everyone. Um, just in February, I was up at the National Conservation Training Center, it's, which is a fish and wildlife property in West Virginia. And they held a big conference um, for federal fish and wildlife staff. There were lighting experts, there were film and glass experts. And then there were people like us who were working with the public. They were academics. So this is growing um, a lot, especially with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, there are national efforts, but 
I think we need to find a way to band together just a bit more. We're good at sharing ideas, but I don't think all of our collective power have been put behind it. So there's a lot going on, um, but we, I think we need more and, and maybe a bit more strategy. And to be honest, in the Southeast, there's been very little done. A lot of where the legislation and ordinances have passed, a lot of where the monitoring has occurred might be where you would expect. A lot in California, Oregon, a lot in the upper Midwest, New York City, and Canada. Um, so we here in Georgia are, in my opinion, I think we're leading the way in the Southeast, um, which is a good thing, but also a sad thing because we need we need more. Um, but yes, that's, that's a long answer and a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, but we are engaged with the architectural community, uh, some building owners and managers, universities, the city of Atlanta, um, but we need to to get more involved, to be honest. Okay, another question. Yeah. Are we engaged with any COA? Is that Atlanta city council members? I think it would help if LEED certification had more credits available for bird safe implementation. It would. So right now, um, stop sharing. Um, right now, LEED only has, they have a one credit, um, one credit for bird collision deterrence. So yeah, it'd be great if it was more. The other thing that'd be great is it would be awesome if LEED shared the buildings that actually use that credit. That data is not as easily accessible as one would hope. Um, but there is some there. For the city of Atlanta, we had a strong relationship with um, Mayor Reed's office less so with, with Keisha, um, no fault of her own, it's just transition of staff and new offices. Um, we right now are engaging a good bit with the Atlanta Regional Commission. Uh, we do not have a strong council support yet. Um, I've been trying to go about it with Atlanta Regional Commission, professors at Georgia Tech, people in the previous mayor's office. Um, and I've talked to a few of the smaller cities, so representatives uh, of the city of Decatur, for example, to try to find the best way to approach this. But um, we have involvement with the city of Atlanta. We're on their green council, um, but not enough about collisions. We do a lot about green space and engaging people and um, all that work, but we don't have as strong a relationship with the city right now as we have in the past. And nothing yet for the coastal cities, but it's it's fresh, so. Let's see what else. Um, Josephine, I don't think we would have any problems with you sharing. Uh, feel free to tag us on all those platforms. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there'd be any problem. Let's see what else. Any other questions? So yeah, I think, you know, when we've met on a lot of these meetings and we talk about our program, we've done a great job with our data collection. We have a nice, uh, you know, small to medium sized, but extremely active group of volunteers, which I hope some of you will join. The retrofitting, um, honestly, we've done more than almost almost anywhere uh, in the country in a short period of time. Um, but yeah, we really want to level that up to new construction um, and to get into the ear of the right people who can make those larger impact um, changes. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will be in touch. I'm sure you'll get a recording of this. We'll probably try to pair that with some materials. Um, hopefully you grabbed our, our emails. If not, you see our names in our boxes. It's just first name dot last name at birdsgeorgia.org. We can answer, again, all questions, get you all the resources. You don't need to be a bird expert, as Sarah said. Just take some photos and we will identify them for you. Um, we are grateful for your interest and hope you can help us. And, uh, now's a great time. As Sarah said, the fall is a bit more, um, active and, and sad at times, uh, for us, but spring, there are definitely birds coming through. It's just a bit more boom or bust. It depends a little bit on the weather conditions and what's going on. Um, but we do get collisions for sure in the spring and they, uh, are just now going to start picking up second half of April, first half of May is when we get the majority. And then we kick back off in mid-August with September and October being um, the busiest time. So thank you again. Please be in touch and we will follow up and enjoy the rest of your evening.
Thank you so much. Thanks, Sarah. Great job.